Good morning, everybody. My name is Eric Whitman. I am a director of machine learning at CVS Health. Excited to be here with you today. Feels a little bit weird to give a talk through headphones. Feels like we're on, on the moon or something, but that's okay. I'm gonna take you to the moon in this talk. Um, this talk is gonna be focused on, on principles um, and hopefully it will save you months in terms of thinking, in terms of strategy of how to build a enterprise grade uh, level RAG system. So let's dive into it. Um, before we do that, let's talk a little bit about CVS Health uh, first. So CVS Health is a big company, both in terms of revenue and in terms of employees. We are F6 company, the second largest healthcare company in the world. We have over $320 billion in revenue, over 300,000 corporate employees, uh, 200,000 retail employees, and roughly 10,000 stores. You might think of CVS Health as a pharmacy, but we're much more than that. We uh, really touch every part of the healthcare ecosystem, almost every part. Uh, we do everything from pharmacy benefits management. We do basic healthcare services through our minute clinics. We do specialty drugs and pharmacy for uh, chronic diseases. We do health insurance through Aetna. And some of the newer lines of business are value-based healthcare through uh, companies like Oak Street Health. So finding information at CVS is hard. The way it typically goes is you need to find out something. You know, let's say you're trying to find information about X. You go and ask a colleague, hey, do you know where I can find X? And they'll point you to another colleague, they'll point you to another colleague, and you start going down this rabbit hole. Eventually, you'll find your answer a couple hours later. Sometimes it might take you up to 24 hours. So we have a very much a, a manual um, search process, which is not a good strategy in 2024. But the reason why it's so difficult is due to the number of employees we have, but also due to the number of knowledge sources that we have. Information can live in over 10 different places at CVS. Some of these places are commercial sources, like your Confluence and SharePoints of the world. Some of them are homegrown solutions for our more sensitive documentation. We we're also a dynamic organization that changes. We have org changes, we do rebranding, documents get moved around different parts of the company. So that makes it difficult to keep track of our documentation. So what we wanna do is improve our search at CVS and the goal is to simplify and unify. We wanna simplify the search process by introducing semantic search and natural language search to our existing sources and we want to unify the process so that our users search through one interface rather than trying to go to these 10 different sources and figure out which one to use. So let's talk about how do we do this. So if you go online and search for RAG, you'll find an illustration that looks something like this. And I think many people are familiar with this, this uh, type of architecture. You have a basic set of documents that you ingest, you extract information from them, break them up into chunks, embed those chunks into vectors and put them in a vector database. Then you can query against that, transform your query into a vector, and do a cosine similarity search, extract the closest vectors in the similar hyperplane, take those vectors, pass them onto your LLM along with the search query, and you can search against your company knowledge. Now, if there's one thing I want you to remember from this talk, it is that this is not enterprise level RAG. This does not scale, this is POC RAG. It does not scale because uh, most of these systems are built for static data sources, built on uniform content from a single source. They're also built on relatively small data sets. Additionally, there are scaling limitations from a software perspective where the system's just not built to support tens of thousands of users. So those are some of the limitations with this architecture. Additionally, we have more challenges at CVS. We have very large document volumes. We have on the order of tens of millions of documents. And it's difficult to figure out what information within that, you know, that big haystack of information is actually valuable. Like I said, we have multiple data sources, but you also have to think, you know, what, what even is a data source? Is it a place where a document lives? Is it meeting notes? Is it, is it chat history? You have to have a definition for what is, what is knowledge? What does that mean to you and your company? And then you need to build a system that can accommodate the document lifecycle. So documents are created, they're edited and modified over time. 
Eventually, that information becomes stale, and the documents are sunset or retired. You also have to consider you know, public versus private documents. Not everybody at a company should have access to everything. Sometimes we have documents that are only accessible by groups of people. So we have to build a system that, that can accommodate for that as well. So how do we do this? So we need to rethink RAG as a product, or really as a set of two products. There's a document ingestion product and a chat product. For each of these products, we have to come up with OKRs and measure analytics against them and come up with features each quarter, try to improve both of these systems and see if we're doing better or worse. You also have to think about your UI points of entry for maximum adoption. So where do our users want to work? Where do they want to access our RAG system? Where do they want to interface with it? And that's going to drive your user adoption. Now, 90% of the data science lives in the document ingestion product. Uh, you know, we do some prompt engineering in the chat app, uh, but that's largely a software product on that side. So we're going to focus on document ingestion since this is a, a data conference. So for our MVP at, at CVS, we're focusing on three different knowledge sources. Uh, the use cases are we're ingesting our documentation. Like, think of like technical architecture documentation for software developers and software best practices. That lives in Confluence. We have a lot of IT policy documents that's in a homegrown source. And we have kind of general policy documents that are in another homegrown source. There's no one size fits all connector to these sources. Sometimes we pull data, sometimes the data is pushed. And that really depends on what's available for that source. Uh, also, the connectivity patterns are different. Sometimes it's REST API, sometimes it's SOAP API, sometimes we're using SFTP. Once again, it just depends on what's available. What we have to do is build CDC mechanisms from, for all these sources to make sure that we get the freshest documentation. The data goes through our firewall. It ends up in our temporary object storage. And once it lands there, that kicks off our data pipelines. So we're building custom data pipelines for all of our sources. And they consist of these, these 10 different steps right here. Although the steps are the same for all the sources, they are executed a little bit differently. They're customized per source. And that's because all the data is unstructured, right? We're working with documents, unstructured data. And we want to try to extract the maximum value for the type of documents that live in each source. So what are we doing in our data pipeline? The first thing that you need to do is map out what is actual content versus uh, metadata versus noise in your documents. Once again, sometimes you know, a document could be a Word document, could be a PDF, could be markdown, it could be data out of a database. Um, so it can take many different forms. After that, we normalize and serialize the data. That means that we try to create a standard structure for the data, and then we convert it to JSON. And that allows for more efficient down, downstream processing. It's a language that developers are very familiar with, and it's just really convenient to work with. After that, we cleanse our data, and we calculate document statistics. The reason why we do statistics is because we want to build a dynamic chunking strategy. If you can understand the structure and uh, you know, what your documents look like, you can create better chunks and I mean, high quality chunking is maybe the most important thing you can do to get really good results in a RAG system. So we calculate those statistics. We then have some PII filters that the documents run through to make sure that we don't have any sensitive information in there. We chunk our documents dynamically, we vectorize them, and then we push our vectors to our vector store. We have extracted our images and tables, and we put them in object storage as well. So let's talk about some of these steps. Um, metadata is going to be your best friend when creating a RAG system because it enables you to do all kinds of different things. Metadata can be used for filtering data from different sources. You can use it to trigger your CDC pipelines. You can use it to manage access control. You can map out related content. Some of our documentation is hierarchical data, so we map out hi hierarchies uh, to other related documents in our metadata. And we store general document information like the statistics I talked about, and author, and source, and when was the document created, and, and so on. But what you need to do is come up with a normalized metadata structure across your different sources. You're going to get different types of metadata from all of your sources. Um, Sometimes the same fields are called different things. So you just have to kind of figure out, what do I need from each source? 
normalize it, and then you can query against it. Like I talked about, we have to build CDC pipelines, and this is really to manage that, that document lifecycle. So we want to know when is a new document created at our, in our sources, when has it been edited, and when has it been deleted. And we want to mirror that in our vector store. Our vector store is not the source of truth for documents. The source of truth still lies out with the sources that we connect to. We're just, we just want to mirror what's happening there. And you have to think about how frequently should we update our vector store? You know, is this a real-time system? You know, quote, real-time, whatever that means to you? Or is this a batch system? For us, uh, we're starting with a 24-hour ingestion and refresh rate. Uh, and we'll probably adjust it from there. Um, it's really a matter of cost and like how much data do you have and, and what does it cost to like continuously uh, adjust these things uh, several times a day versus just doing one big batch at off-peak off hours. You also have to build this uh, with microservices, right? So if you remember the RAG architecture diagram, you know, that was kind of a, a monolith architecture. We want to break our two products up, the document ingestion part and the software part, into microservices for those two products. Um, and we're doing this with uh, Docker for containerization and Kubernetes for the microservices themselves. Uh, we're using Helm to create and deploy those microservices and GitHub Actions for our CD, CI CD pipelines. But the nice part about doing this is that we can decouple the workload for the developers, it allows for faster iteration, and they can work on different parts of the system and, and parallel and keep iterating on it. You also have to think about safety and monitoring, um, keeping our users safe. And we do that by logging everything. So we capture our session logs, and that enables us to do things like show users their chat history. We allow them to save items through those session logs as well. And we're calling them pinned items here in this diagram. We also capture the user feedback for individual queries. So think of like thumbs up, thumbs down, uh, and even a written feedback that allows us to iterate and, and improve the system um, over time. And then from those session logs, we can build analytics dashboards and platforms from there and track those KPIs that I talked about early, early on and make sure that the system gets better over time. We can also set up alerting um, through these session logs and detect if someone's trying to abuse the system or break it and either send them warnings or block them from the system altogether. And like I said, we have PII filters, but that's on the vectorization pipeline, so that's not really on the, on the user side. OK, so now you've built your, your platform. And uh, the way to approach this is you know, it's really a software project up front, building just all the technical infrastructure. And then once you have your basic platform, it turns into a data science problem. There's a lot of different points for optimization in your platform once it's built. And I don't have time to talk about all these techniques that are listed on the slide. But the idea that, that I want you to remember here is that it's good to think of this in terms of buckets. You know, what is, are the, what's the most important thing I can do in terms of pre-retrieval strategies? What's the most important thing I can do in the retrieval? And what's the best thing that I can do in, in post-retrieval? You want to optimize in each of these buckets to kind of maximize the overall system performance. Evaluation is also extremely important, right? We have to know as we keep adding more and more documents, as we add more and more sources, are we breaking our system? A lot of people are trying to figure out the best way for RAG evaluation today. There's, there's no real standard. Um, but there's, at a high level, there's three ways to think about it. You have manual evaluation, you have SME evaluation, or automated LLM evaluation. Um, and the process is really kind of the, the same for all three of them, where you take a set of test documents, come up with a set of test questions, and track relevancy and context uh, against those questions over time. A good way to approach this is maybe start with automated um, tracking. It's the kind of the least, uh, least expensive thing to do. Um, and then over time, you'll probably go into SME review, depending on you know, who you're, what departments you're working with within your company, and then kind of learn from them, and then you can transfer that manual evaluation over to uh, kind of a general lower cost employee over time. Um, but you know, you're going to have to figure out the metrics that make sense for you and your company. Then we have what I call the LLM holy trinity, balancing cost, speed, and quality. A lot of times uh, when people build systems, they start down there in the lower corner uh, focusing on speed. 
And you're going to add more and more complexity to your system, trying new architectures and more advanced techniques. So you, you won't move towards the quality side. You might also start drifting towards the cost side. Um, what I think is going to happen in the industry, right now there seems to be an appetite to and a willingness to spend uh, money on systems. But I think that people are going to be focusing on cost savings over time and really kind of pushing uh, towards more efficient uh, use of fine-tuned LLMs versus the, you know, the commercial LLMs. You also have to think about ways to get faster because it's all about user experience uh, in the end. So think about you know, if you have a multi-step retrieval approach, maybe using smaller, faster models for some steps. Think about things like caching um, and ways to drive down your speed. And finally, I want to leave it on a note just kind of talking about how do you get started. So as we kicked off this project, we spent probably about two, two and a half months doing discovery, just trying to figure out, what, like I said, what is a knowledge source? What's our definition of a knowledge source? Mapping out what they are across our company, figuring out who the owners are, how much data is in each source? Is that data valuable? What's the ROI for each source? How many people can actually benefit if we uh, implement search across this, this source? How do we connect to that source? How is it even feasible? So there's a lot of product, strategic, and technical questions that you have to do up front even before getting into architecture and software development. Second point is don't boil the ocean. Don't do too much too fast. Pick two to three sources, start with them, try to figure out which ones add the most value to your company. And as you keep working on your system, you're gonna have to do a trade-off where you have to decide if you're gonna go wide or deep. Am I gonna go wide and keep adding more and more sources to my system, or am I gonna go deeper and add more and more documentation from a source. Uh, typically, you can't do both at the same time. You're going to have to make a decision there. Uh, and you're going to kind of go back and forth this uh, dynamic of, of optimization versus software development and expansion, like I talked about. And you'll kind of jump back and forth between that continuously as you kind of measure the performance of your system. And then finally, think about building to scale. So that means building uh, things in terms of Lego blocks, having a platform mentality so you can easily swap swap modules in and out, test new LLMs, uh, test new embedding models, uh, uh, et cetera. Also, from kind of a leadership perspective, think about your team structure. Your initial build team will probably look a little bit different than your steady state team, because it does become more of a data science problem over time. So uh, keep that in mind as well. And then finally, I want to end on a note, you know, kind of a philosophical note. What is truth? You know, what is truth? All of us can observe the same event from different perspectives, and it'll mean different things to us. Um, in this process of, of building this platform, I've found that a lot of teams struggle to identify what is the source of truth for their team, especially if it's a large team. And at CVS, we've found that not you know, building an AI search platform alone won't solve our search problem, that this is really a technical, a human, and a governance problem. So we're developing additional software outside of this platform to help our teams manage and track document life cycles and, and documentation, mark them as sources of truth, and then we can ingest them into this platform so we don't have the problem with garbage in and garbage out. So that's something you're going to have to think about as well. How do you help teams govern their, uh, their document management? So I hope you found this talk helpful. Um, I would love to connect with you on LinkedIn. There's a QR code here that you can scan if you're interested. And I'm happy to take any questions if you have any.